Okay. Uh, designers, people who uh, work in some form of design. Great. Um, how about uh, business? Represent business. Good. Great. Um, education, foundations. Any foundations out here? Okay. So if you're not any, of, is anybody an engineer? Okay. So beyond anything I've mentioned, give me some ideas of what you do and CEOs. Joe. Okay, Joe Hensel, and, and my, I have a consultancy called Atmet. I work on the commercialization of advanced energy and advanced material technology. Right now, I work a lot of all capacitor for grid level energy storage. In the past, I helped. Uh, I'm sure there's people in here involved in food systems. Um, yeah, there you go. I'm Chris Storm with Crown Point Ecology Center. And I couldn't really call myself a, an educator or really a farmer. We're kind of both, but right. nice speakers. So the reason why I'm asking is because um, biomimicry affects everything. <laughs> Uh, if we start to think uh, sustainably and think uh, naturally, we will understand how important biomimicry is. And uh, if you're a designer or engineer, you know that diversity at the table in the beginning when you're designing makes all the difference in the long-term success of what you're designing and in its sustainability. So um, the last time we met, we were talking about sustainability in business design uh, from the beginning in Evergreen Cooperatives, how a triple bottom line company started and really an industry was uh, conceived and uh, planted and is growing in Cleveland. And um, that shows the innovation of thinking with sustainably. So this week, um, we're going to talk about biomimicry and it all started with this book. I would say, how many people know who Rachel Carson is in Silent Spring? This book is our generation's version of that. Bar none, I would say, uh, has changed the way we think. And has been, this revolution's been going on for the last 10, 15 years, I'd say. Right? Almost 20. Almost 20. Um, we are a privilege to have the University of Akron and the Great Lakes Bioinnovation Network speak to us about what's happening in the greater um, Northeast Ohio region, but specifically Akron. We are very proud of the fact that we have one of the most innovative um, things going on in biomimicry that will have world impact, not just impact locally. Um, it's such a big deal that um, you guys <laughs> are uh, getting to hear about it in the, in the beginning stages of just the start of the uh, first year of the PhD program that uh, we'll be talking about tonight. So um, um, what's exciting about it for Akron is because Akron was such an innovative uh, hub for the um, Industrial Revolution. And we believe that if we start to think biomimicry like a uh, biologist and think in the on the principles of life and sustainability, we can become um, the innovation hub for the 21st century of sustainability. And uh, that isn't really a big dream that is not possible. That is really beginning to happen here. So um, our speakers tonight are Peter Neveroski. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, his name looks like an eye chart, so I'm always thrilled when I get it right. <laughs> Um, he's professor of biology and integrated bioscience at the University of Akron. Uh, we have doc doctoral students who uh, will be speaking, and they'll tell you their names when they start. And we have Carol Thaler, director of outreach and administration for Great Lakes Biomimicry. Right there. She's right back there. And uh, we would love to uh, give them a warm welcome, if you would, and uh, thank you. For Daphne's going up. We're, we're going to tag team this thing. So Daphne's going to start us off. I feel like you guys are really far away. 
Do you want to come a little closer? Or? The sound is good. Don't okay. Worry about that. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here and uh, wanting, to, wanting to learn more about biomimicry. This is a short overview of what we will be talking tonight. So first, I will give a general introduction about biomimicry. Then um, Emily will talk about the relationship between biomimicry and sustainability. After that, Peter will um, discuss about uh, recent developments at the University of Akron and also um, about collaborative activities with Great Lakes Biomimicry. Then the Biomimicry fellow students will uh, talk a little bit more about ourselves and Carol will end tonight with uh, talking about the GL Bio and uh, the Biomimicry Network. So Biomimicry, it's actually pretty hard to give a solid definition that is uh, that means the same for everyone and that entails all essential parts, but I think this one does it pretty good. Biomimicry is actually the conscious emulation of natural forms, processes, and systems. Conscious means that biomimicry practitioners have intended actions. They actively look into nature and ask themselves um, the question, did nature already solve my design problem? By asking questions such as, how does nature capture and store solar energy? Or how does nature keep itself cool? Emulating is about the fact that it's not a direct or uh, exact copy of your natural organism, but it's rather capturing and abstracting uh, successful strategies and implementing those on your design and adapting it to human needs. And then the last part is why would uh, what can we learn from nature's wisdom and time-tested strategies? So we humans are only one species of about um, 30,000 million species that are currently existing on our planet and we are all living under the same conditions. So, um, as humans are a relative young species and therefore are actually rather um, inexperienced innovators, we can assume that uh, nature had, or other species in nature had uh, much more time to adapt to the, to the existing conditions and to come up with successful strategies to survive. And, um, just one example of how nature, of what we can learn from looking to nature to solve a design problem, is this. It's uh, the bullet train, in J which is uh, from Japan, and it's the fastest train in the world. It can travel uh, with speeds of up to 200 miles per hour, but there was one really big problem. Every time it exits the tunnel, it creates a very uh, loud sound boom. So, uh, sorry, a loud uh, sonic boom. And um, Nakatsu, who is the chief train engineer, um, he asked himself the question, what is there anything in nature that uh, has to travel smoothly and quickly between different mediums? And as he is also a very an uh, avid bird watcher, he realized that the kingfisher has to fly from air into water and creates almost <coughs> no splashes. And uh, he, he uh, emulates the front end, he emulated the front end of the bullet train to the kingfisher's beak. And so he created a train that, that was much, much quieter and also could travel 10% faster with 50, by using 50% less energy. So biomimicry is a shift from what we can extract from nature to what we can learn from nature. It is actually um, a, sh a shift away from movements such as biotilization, which is um, the extraction from nature. It's also a step away from biotechnology, which is the um, <coughs> exploitation of biological processes for industrial purposes, and also away from genetic engineering which is the manipulation of uh, an organism's genome. 
So biomimicry is um, becoming naturally attuned and, and using um, existing tools that are readily available in our backyards. <laughs> it's actually asking nature to share its successful recipes. And um, why, I become, why, I'm, uh, why, why I am so, um, so um, excited about biomimicry and why I think everyone should be uh, excited should be excited and if not already um, is because that by using by looking into by, lo by looking um, by using nature's genius as a um, as a tool for designing innovative um, processes it it opens a lot of um, opportunities for almost any fields such as um, energy Medic medicine, um, architecture, engineering, but also less straightforward fields such as uh, economy or organizational developments. And as already said, it uh, biomimicry got popularized in 1997 by this bestseller, Biomimicry in a Innovation Inspired by Nature, which was written by Janine Benyus. And we were uh, honored to welcome <coughs> Janine Benyus giving a lecture at our university's uh, at the University of Athens E.J. Thomas Hall this past September. It was we were only about a month in our program, so that was really exciting and motivating for us. And the fact that she gave a talk in this very city shows uh, proves Northeast Ohio's growing engagement with biomimicry. Are there any questions so far? Can you guys hear okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh-huh, yep. <coughs> okay, I'll try to project, so just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so I'm Emily, and I'm gonna shift over and now talk about um, how biomimicry and sustainability relate to one another. So, as you guys know, Northeast Ohio has been thinking about sustainability for the last decade. Um, it started with nonprofits like Entrepreneurs for Sustainability, E4S, um, Eco City Cleveland, which evolved into Green City Blue Lake, uh, government initiatives like Sustainable Cleveland 2019, and the Cuyahoga Valley Initiative, which Carol was actually a part of. Carol will get up and speak in, in a few minutes. Um, and more recently, regional governments are working on a grant for Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities Consortium from the Federal Housing and Urban Development Administration. So thinking about all these things, it's clear that Northeast Ohioans are aspi aspiring to achieve a uh, sustainable future for their children and grandchildren. Um, so how does biomimicry come into play with that? Well. Biomimicry reframes sustainability um, for Northeast Ohio and beyond by turning the traditional notion of sustainability on its head. Um, sustainability is not just about conservation, about reducing negative impact that you have on the environment. Rather, um, bi biomimicry makes sustainability a profitable opportunity. Sustainable innovators using biomimicry can rake in the big bucks and uh, positively impact the local economy rather than just reducing negative impact on the environment. So a 2010 report from the Romanian Business and Economic Institute projected that by 2025, biomimicry could represent 300 billion annually of US gross domestic product and could account for 1.6 million US jobs. And we're already starting to see progress. The number of patents on biomimetic technologies has experienced a rapid climb, jumping 14-fold between just 2000 and 2010. And biomimicry really is it's not just this fantasy. We can achieve it. Um, and there's already products on the market. For example, there's a Lotus Leaf-inspired self-cleaning paint um, by Lotusan, a company called Lotusan which mimics the surface pattern on a lotus leaf. Um, water droplets can't grab onto that leaf, so they roll off and they collect dirt particles as they roll, so hence the self-cleaning. Um, and that kind of paint can be put on the exterior facade of a house, for example. And there's also a boxfish-inspired car by Damsler Chrysler. 
Um, it mimics the <coughs> hydrodynamic form of the box fish. And when you look at that fish, you probably wouldn't think, oh wow, that looks like it has a really low drag coefficient, but, but it does. And the car that mimics its form is actually able to run on 70 miles per gallon, so it's pretty impressive. And then the last one that is pictured here is a humpback whale flipper inspired wind turbine, which enhances the power, um, the power that you can get, the power yield, at low wind speeds. So you can get 20% more wind energy yield annually. And on top of that, these wind turbines are actually quieter than conventional models. So as you can see, nature's designs are a largely untapped uh, source of inspiration for profitable, sustainable innovation. Uh, because natural organisms, processes, and systems are sustainable by necessity. And they've been time tested by 3.8 billion years of research and development. So for me, I, and I think you guys will be able to see this too, that biomimicry is a tangible thing that we can do to contribute to Northeast Ohio's sustainable future. I, I'm Bill. Uh, please allow me to just sit here and talk because it's not that, that I'm being shy. It's because I don't feel really comfortable today. So sorry about that. Um, so along, along following with MA's thread, uh, I'm going to show you an example about uh, biomimicry and explain how biomimicry can relate to sustainability. And I will explain this example in more detail. So. Uh, but before I started, I just want to make an announcement that personally, I don't have any affiliation with this product or company in any form. So, yeah, <laughs> knowing that, then I can begin. So this product is called LFC. LFC stands for Low Friction Coating, and there's A in front of it means advanced, and that actually the advanced is the the advanced coding is a second generation of the previous LSC and it's also uh, take the inspiration from Tuna. And the second generation product just launched into the marketplace last month actually. And it's from a Japanese company called Nippon Pen Marine. And when you think about Tuna, they swim really fast. They can travel under the water with a speed faster than 60 miles per hour. And not, that's not just because they're uh, streamlined body shape, but that's also because there is a sp special mucus on, their, on the surface of, of their skin. And the scientists actually take, that is, take the inspiration from tuna and mimic, emulate that, and uh, make a form of coating applied to the underwater uh, part of the ship. And that, that is the, the product you see here. And how, how does it work? It's actually that when you apply a conventional coating, and there's inevitably be a, a microscopic bumps like like seen here, and because of the roughness of the of, of the surface, there will be turbulence uh, cr created on the bumps and in the, on the, at the bottom of the bumps. But this type type of coating mimic the mucus of the tuna fish, and then they add a layer of hydrophilic hydrogel. Hydro hydrophilic means water loving or uh, water attracting. So they actually track a layer of water on the surface, and this surface uh, is unique thickness, and so it maintains the curvature of the of the uh, coating underneath. But this is while the ship is not moving. Once the ship is moving the water layer actually gets thinner on the part that is uh, protruding out of the water because of the motion of the flow. But the, the water that's trapped on, at the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, curvature is not. It maintains similar thickness. And even the fact that the ship go even faster, all of the water layer get removed here, but still here you will, the water will remain there all the time. And that actually decreases the turbulence, so minimize the uh, drag and friction. Another mechanism is that on the left hand side is a conventional coating and on the right hand side is the uh, LFC. Um, as I already said, the turbulence will uh, create it here. And actually during uh, the lifetime of the coating, they will get self-published. -pop -published. And that's because you know uh, the erosion happens, so over time it gets smoother and smoother. But because of this kind of surface will have turbulence here. 
So even though even though the the water flow is at not as strong as the bottom, but still there will has erosion occurs here because of the turbulence. It's just not it's just that uh, the erosion happens here is less significant than, than the one up there, so it gets smoother. But since we already know that this water layer will always trap in there, so they protect this part from in, uh, erosion totally. So that's why over time, LFC surface gets even more smoother than the conventional ones. And in an in a experiment, if you apply this kind of coating in a, a surface, flat surface underwater, it can decrease up to 50% of the friction. But considering that the, the friction source of, of the ship is not just from other one, uh, underwater line, but also there are air resistance involved in the in portion uh, above water line. So overall, if you, we apply, just applying this coating um, under the water line portion of the ship, it actually can decrease 10% of the, the fuel and, and hence less CO2 e emissions. Um, 10% maybe doesn't sound that much to you, but if you consider a cargo ship that has a more than 5,000 20 foot equivalent cargo capacity, it actually consumes about 100 metric tons of fuel a day. And the, the price of the fuel is about this, and then every day you need this amount of money to operate just one ship, and that and 10 percent of that saving actually trans translates to up to 3.5 million dollars annually just for one ship. So consider the uh, economical uh, benefit and also good for the environment. It's not surprising that since four years ago the first gen generation of this product LFC is launched out of the market, over 800 ships already apply and adapt this technology. Mm. So that's my part and Peter will tell you a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. our Bell Mimicry Innovation Center. So this is this is, I think of that, about this as an informal setting. So why don't we take a break and see, do you guys have any uh, questions or comments for the stuff that we talked about so far? Give you a chance to talk maybe a little bit? Peter? Yes. Uh, it's all amazing stuff. It's fun to listen to biomimicry stories. Uh, so that part's fun. But uh, here's a question that uh, we were talking before we came here. There seems to be sort of like two categories biomimicry research, one, maybe you call it, you know, technology, what you, you know, used to be called hard science, and then the other one is almost like social science kind of stuff, how do, how do populations behave? And uh, how does that work with your research and your program? Because it's almost like you're a, a biologist, uh, just how, how, you know, you need yeah. social scientists involved in the program? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Actually, um, Without giving you some kind of like global answer to that, I mean, maybe Emily can speak to that. Cause sure. Um, so I'm actually not a biologist. Uh, my background is in social sciences. I studied environmental studies and international relations in undergrad. So some things that I've been looking at since I've been in the program are things like reciprocity, reciprocity in uh, groups of natural organisms and in what community structures does reciprocity involve. Um, whether it's modular community structures or structures where you interact frequently with, a, frequently with a small number of other group members. So thinking about uh, what factors uh, are conducive to reciprocity in nature and trying to think about how you could apply that to a corporate environment, for example, to foster collaboration amongst employees. Uh, but there's a whole slew of things you can study for a social science application as well. That's a part of our program, we don't just focus on technology alone. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and comment, and uh, so and, and so the the overarching answer, and Emily, that's a great, great job, the overarching answer is that biomimic really applies across the spectrum. So there are things that we can learn about materials, there are things that we can learn about processes, there are things we can learn about information flow and organization, and um, to the extent that we have academic structures at typical universities that deal in those areas, and we know we do, there are things to be learned with a biomimetic lens uh, from natural systems. So it's a great question. Okay. I can kind of yeah. Um, I, I teach, uh, I'm an anthropologist and ecological anthropologist, and I teach in case Western and Canada. I teach biomimicry as part of what I do, and uh, using living systems models, and uh, 
if we understand how living systems work, then that will allow us to uh, more effectively live our lives as, as uh, living organisms. And I like what somebody said earlier here, but we share the same planet as the rest of these organisms. We weren't beamed here. You know, as, uh, some people think we were only here for 5,000 years, and that's a whole other thing. You know, but if we weren't beamed here, well, then we do occupy the same space as other, as other creatures, and we can le learn from them. And so, and then many societies, uh, well, almost every society that has existed besides our modern Western society has had much more interaction with nature and emulated through, through totemism and many different types of, of procedures like that. And so we look at traditional societies and even feng shui in China and this type of thing to see this emulation process as, as embedded in those cultures. And so by looking at traditional cultures throughout the world, we're able to see uh, biomimicry expressed in a, in, a, in a variety of fashions for survival and for to survive and thrive. I, I really like what the person said about sustainability, that, it, that this idea of thriving, that, that uh, it isn't a matter of, that, that cultures never existed just to survive. They all existed with this notion of how can we thrive. And so this, this notion